Welcome to the D.A.R.E. podcast, where it is all about helping people overcome anxiety and panic attacks. The D.A.R.E. app has over 1 million downloads and is free to download at dareresponse.com. Now, without further ado, here is the D.A.R.E. podcast. Hello. So I, um, Zoom kept uh, throwing me out, so sorry I'm late. But I, I know, it usually throws me out. I'm surprised yeah. it was you. <laughs> Good. Hello, everybody. So I'm just opening the questions for today. Do you know where it starts, Michelle? Is it the very um, Indy, Indy sent us a link. Go in that recorded section in Slack, and she sent yeah, us a there. link. Okay. So I, I have the one I started with. The one I see here is I can't make myself write a paper. Yes. Okay. We're the same. Okay. Good. So why don't we jump right in? We hope we can get through a lot of questions. And guys, thank you to everybody who submitted questions. We are unfortunately never able to go through all of them, but in the end, we do kind of answer all of them because you will see how the day response is interwoven in all of what we talk about. And it does fit to, to I would say, to 99% of all the questions that you guys submit. Yeah. And Right. Yeah. So this is just to put a little more in context. And as we go through these questions, if this is something that you have a, you know, have a hard time with pop on in the chat and we'll chat along with everybody here as we go through these questions. All right. So this first question, it's, this is kind of a nice one because it's a little bit different. Um, I can't make myself write a paper. I just can't. And I don't know why is this anxiety. I know we're kind of missing a whole lot of context in that question. Um, so if you, whoever submitted that question, or if you have a similar question, if you happen to be on the chat, feel free to chat along and we'll, we'll go through this question. Yeah, it's a little bit hard to answer that because there is not much, not much context, but I assume that that's a paper maybe for your studies or for, for your work, I guess. And maybe this is some form of procrastination. That could be something. Um, if it is procrastination, then maybe start small, set yourself small goals, maybe just sit down, write for 20 minutes and then do something enjoyable. Maybe, I don't know, scroll through social media, or make yourself a hot chocolate, reward yourself for every 20 minutes that you do that. Um, if it is, if you feel very sensitized and nervous and you feel like you cannot focus on your work and all your, on your studies, that is very common with anxiety that you have brain fog, lack of focus, impaired memory, all these things, because there's just not enough energy for cognitive performance. Uh, if that is the case, really go back to the basics, try to have a good night's rest. And here again, go slow, lots of fluids and just trust that it will pass. Maybe you do not have a deadline for the paper, which would help in this case. But if you do, just, just try to not add more stress to, to an already stressed situation. Right. And, and even just using the words, if you're saying writing a paper, if I have to sit down and write an eight page paper, we tend to think in these, these ways of like, I have to write the, the whole eight page paper right now, as opposed to you're not writing an eight page paper, you're writing one word at a time. And so mm -hmm. if I can't make myself write a paper, we tend to go, I have to do this whole eight page paper. It's too much to even imagine doing that. It's, and we overwhelm ourselves with the idea of the whole paper. And then we kind of just, it keeps us stuck here doing nothing immobilization. And so I, I can't, I can't imagine doing that. So I'll, I'll do nothing. And then I don't know if you're also experiencing anxiety. I know, again, the, the question is a little vague, um, try and chunk it right? Oh, I'm not writing. I'm not writing a paper today. I'm writing an introductory, introductory paragraph and I'm writing five sentences, period. And I'm giving myself this very large period of time to do this very small period of work. And when you sort of take a big task and chunk it, it can be helpful. Now this can go beyond writing papers. This could be, um, this could be like, I'm taking, I'm, I'm, I'm taking an eight hour international flight. Again, even just that can feel overwhelming because there's multiple steps in between there. So come back to right now. What am I doing right now? What's, what's my task for the next 15? If I, if, in order to write this paper, these things need to be on the paper. So when you make out certain tasks to do, and then you focus on one task on the time and you, again, put it more into chunks, it's a little more manageable. Yeah, for what it's worth, like remember Michelle, all the papers we have written. <laughs> oh my God overwhelming it's it's not something that and then sometimes people. though but then then you realize like they all get done somehow and when you look back you're like yeah how the heck 
how in the world did I do all those process recordings? It feels so overwhelming. But when you drop the pressure and just kind of stay here, I don't know how, I don't know how those papers got written, but somehow they all somehow get written. Yeah. The only thing that really helps is doing it. That's yeah. The only thing. <clears throat> and so sorry for my voice. <clears throat> A little cracky today. Okay. Next question from Andrew. I'm currently dealing with intrusive thoughts, sensory motor OCD, where I'm focusing on my breathing and trying to control it rather letting, oh, I'm sorry. I can't scroll down here. Letting, ah, Michelle, okay, sorry. Rather, <laughs> rather than letting it do it by itself manually. Mm -hmm. I get fixated on this and it drives me mad. This normally happens when my anxiety is peaking or if I'm sitting alone with my thoughts. Mm -hmm. We got quite a few intrusive thought questions yeah. pop up. So in case we don't get to your specific one, listen to this one because it'll probably be pretty applicable. We also had our last webinar. Um, you might want to listen to that one with Dr. Seif. He came on. Um, and our webinar with um, his co-author, Dr. Winston, is posted on our YouTube channels, all about thoughts. Yeah. So, Michelle, how is sensory motor OCD different from, let's say, normal OCD or normal anxious thoughts? I mean, well, so sensory motor OCD is basically you getting involved in something that's not your business to get involved with, right? These are things that happen automatically, that it's not your job to do consciously. Blinking, breathing, swallowing, your heart beating, basically all the stuff your body does. It's not your business. I would, I would throw in sleep in there too. I mean, a lot of this stuff, it's so overlapping because it's us trying to control stuff that's not our control. And so he worded it perfectly. Sensory motor OC, where I'm focusing on my breathing and trying to control it rather than letting it do it by itself manually. Exactly. So the the problem piece in that, like the, the part that's changeable is when I see the word focus, when I'm aware that I'm focusing on my breathing, that's the part we're going to shift first. I don't need to focus on my breathing. My body breathes. And when I'm trying to manually breathe and I'm trying to stop trying to manually breathe, like doing more doing doesn't let it go. It's going into this, this state of being of notice I'm staring at my breathing and then practicing moving my, my attention from it and leaving my breathing alone. You may feel more anxiety when you leave your breathing alone because it feels like I need to care, keep a careful eye on this or else, right? But it's, that was act, that's actually what the problem is, keeping a careful eye on something that doesn't require your careful eye. Yeah, and of course you cannot help but notice that you're staring at these things, right? It does; it happens automatically. <clears throat> I'm so sorry. So you don't want to focus on these things, but it just happens. You you cannot do anything about those moments where you check in and notice. But the next step, where where does your focus stay? Right. <clears throat> so maybe if you can recall, we talked in our last calls about perspective, attitude, and I'm going to add focus in there, right? So when you notice, oh, I'm staring at my breathing or I'm hyper-focused on my heartbeat, let's start with perspective. Perspective is what is going on? Oh, okay, this is this OCD thing running at the moment. Attitude, radical acceptance, and redirect your focus. That's really all you get to do. And then just write it out and wait it out. That's the hardest part, right? Because we think as long as we're active, we can somehow manipulate it and make it go away faster, which you... In 99.9% .9 of the cases, just makes it worse. Right? So don't waste your energy there. Focus on perspective. What is it? Oh, it's just OCD theme, attitude, radical acceptance, and focus, redirect your focus onto something that is important. And sometimes it's, it's the smallest things that you need to focus on. Go and doing your laundry, bringing your kids to school, whatever. It doesn't have to be always value-based, driven, the big things, your hobbies. What's important? What is what, what's on your plate today, right? Running errands, stuff like that. The more you make your life important, the less important the anxiety becomes. And you guys, those three steps, perspective, attitude, and focus applies to everything. Right. And that, and that ties into our line. We owe it the opposite of anxiety is trust. Sensory motor OCD, especially zero trust in your own body. 
I need to manually breathe or what if I stop breathing? So better keep staring at my breathing. And we just stay involved. We stay involved back here. And we were never meant to be involved back here. We're meant to be living out here. And so when you notice your, your focus is inward, notice being focused inward, not what you're looking at. Right. Oh, I'm, I'm staring at my breathing. Well, notice in order to be staring at your breathing, I'm, I must be staring inside myself. And like Aida was saying, it doesn't always have to be about my bigger values. It's, is this behavior useful right now? Am I doing something helpful? Am I doing something productive? If I'm not, I'm going to attach my actions and energy and behaviors to something more productive, more useful, more enjoyable right? You only have so much energy for the day. And most people who are doing this are really freaking tired and exhausted because it's exhausting to manually keep yourself alive all day long. So if you're tired, you should be if you're doing this, right? So it's, it's learning how to survive through survivable things and not and learning how to let go of the parts that don't need our active involvement. I see somebody in the chat said we're cutting it. Does anybody else hear me cutting out, hear us cutting out or is it just? No, I hear you just fine. You hear me fine. Nobody else. Okay. Okay. All right, guys, do you find this helpful? Anybody else notice this? It's, it's, there's a difference between notice and focus. Notice is not our problem. Again, if you're in a heightened state, anxiety help shines a light brighter so you'll be able to take in more stimuli and you'll notice more things. It's where we then lock our focus in is where we get stuck in, where we keep perpetuating the cycle. Oh, I just noticed my breathing was funny. And now I'm going to keep staring at my breathing for the next four to seven hours and try and not notice. No, you get involved, unfocused refocus somewhere else that's more useful and productive. And then you will notice that you accidentally stop noticing it. It's one of those things that happen by accident. Yes. But you know, the word radical and radical acceptance is so important. <laughs> Be radical in how you approach it. Be radical in, in, in the way you, you leave it alone and don't stir it around. It's so important. Sometimes we can manage to, bring ourselves to accept it, let's say 60% or 80%, but then ah, let me go and Google something. Let me go and do something. Don't do that. It, un it undoes, does your, all the good work you have, you have put in so far. So be radical, leave shit alone, write that down on your mirror or get a cup where you can maybe, you know, print it on, on a cup, buy it on Amazon somewhere, leave shit alone. Yep. That's the most important thing. And it is the hardest thing to teach people how to leave shit alone. That's really what, oh, here's, here's this thing. I don't like it. Oh, can you do something about it to get rid of it? Yes. Great. Get rid of it. Oh, actually, no, leave that shit alone. Yeah. But how I'm trying, I'm tr trying to leave something alone and leaving something alone are two totally different mindsets. And so uh, Hannah just wrote something in on the chat I wanted to address too. Would you say focusing obsessively on emotion slash internal state is kind of sensory motor OCD? I know labels don't really matter, but this is what I do. So I'm interested. Yeah. Yeah. I notice. Take a, it's kind of like, I call it like your emotional weather. If you look out the window and you notice there's weather there that you don't like, is your focus changing it? Is your involvement useful? Is it practical? Is it helpful? Is it making any change? If not, it's then we're focused and trying to do something about the states we don't like oh, I'm being happy about the states we do like. It's all very similar. That's why none of us are really that big on labels and diagnoses. It's all about how where we're hooking these, we're just hooking fights and different kinds of fights to different sorts of things, which is where the different labels are coming from. Now, what kind of theme is running? It's almost like the anxiety show, Broadway. And today we have OCD. And tomorrow we have intrusive thoughts. And the next day we have physical sensations. The factors that perpetuate it are usually always the same, no matter what triggers them. People are usually very affixed at, oh, what triggered this? What triggered this? It's interesting to know. Don't get me wrong. So it's, you, you can kind of complete your story. You know, okay, this happened. This led to this. But it's really of no little help in the here and now. You mm -hmm. always want to look at 
what is perpetuating this? And this is usually the rumination part, the catastrophization, and the focusing on it, putting life on hold. This is in 90% of the cases, this is what keeps it going. Right? So right. only when you master this and just be, be honest with yourself, if you have mastered this and have done this long enough time and you do not see any improvement, then maybe you can look at if there's maybe something physical going on, right? But usually this, this takes care of it. And somebody commented here, okay, but how to not notice them when doing that for so long? Now, don't worry about that. That's not, don't worry about not noticing something. Like, here's a good example. Aida, I could give you a hug. I know you sound so stuffy. (laughs) And I noticed that you sound stuffy, but I don't freaking care. And nobody (laughs) cares. They just want all of your information. They want you to talk. So you guys, especially if you've known us for a while, you know that she sounds a little stuffy. You've noticed, you're not going to not notice it. And it doesn't matter if you noticed it or not. You also notice her hair looks good and her makeup's on point uh. and she looks good in black. So you can notice all those things too. What are you focused on right now? Mm-hmm. I think you're more focused on her words and what's important. And so that's, don't worry about not noticing or trying to not notice. I, a lot of people get stuck there. You don't notice it, but how, what do you do next? What happens a millisecond after you've noticed that thing? Here yes, comes something. Michelle, yeah. yeah, millisecond, right? That's key Millisecond, word. yeah. Millisecond, because that's so important. Because this then determines how this is going to go. Right? Sorry, I told you. But yeah, I no, it. like here's this thing. I know if you're listening to this, is if this is up as a podcast, I'm just holding like a little fuzzy thing up. Here's this thing that showed up. And if you notice that now that you've noticed I picked this up, millisecond later, you're like, Oh, and you kind of just carry on whatever this is, whether you like it or not, it's irrelevant. But if you're in now, you, you, I pick this up and you become involved in it. You tell a whole story about it. You're now focused on this. And this is so important. That's what we're trying to change here. Not this, this piece. So notice without the focus. If I may address Amanda's comment. So Amanda said, how do you shift your focus from trying to heal? I'm battling this daily. And you see, I don't want to be so so picky about words, but trying to heal really implies that you're putting in a lot of effort. And I understand. I understand that your goal is to to be free of it. I understand that you want to be anxiety free. The problem is, and we can always just say this again and again and again, because it's at the heart of things that trying to change this is the very thing that keeps it going. Because it's it's like a cat chasing its tail. And sometimes, you know, when I hear myself talk, I'm like, oh my God, I don't remember the times you had anxiety. And if someone would have told you, you know, just accept it. It's okay. It's okay. Like the, this can't be cured with acceptance. This is too intense. It's much I tried to accept out. it. It didn't work. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So I get I, I get the frustration and the impatience and sometimes even the belief that this thing is bigger than than what acceptance could do for you. Right. But again, look at maintaining factors. If you are constantly trying to get away from your body, to get away from your mind and from its sensations, you are signaling to your amygdala the very thing that is causing all these sensations mm-hmm. that there is danger. And that guy's like, oh, danger. Okay, let me help you. Here is more energy. And then you get to experience more of your sensations. And this is why the analogy with the cat chasing its tail is so fitting. Because if you, if you want to stop that, you must stop running. And Michelle has my all-time favorite analogy with the jogging, right? How do you know? Michelle, say Which one? Again. You know, with the jogging, with the heart. Huh? You know, how does your heart know when to stop beating when you go for a job oh 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 right the guy's out and running and running and running and you um, have to say that on every call because it's so (laughs) perfect and it's so important yeah so you know you don't see somebody out there running and he's running for three days and three days later the same guy's running and you're like why are you still running like well i have to keep running because my lungs keep pumping and my heart keeps pumping and when my body calms down then i'll stop running no your body is keeping up with you and you are trying to do something until your body slows down and you're sending 
back and forth two different messages. You send the message first. Your bot, you stop running first. But see, the problem is we're also kind of impatient people. Um, when you stop running, your body is, you're still out of breath. So you don't stop running and there's immediate, like your body comes immediately regular, regulated, right? It's, it starts the process of winding itself down, but you have to stop the running first. And just back to, I just wanted to, on Amanda's question, what you were just answering before. Yeah, but you oh, forgot important. to say something. <laughs> the important part is when, when you come home from a jog, you don't tell your heart, hey, heart, we're back at home. You can calm oh, down. Yeah. It's time to calm down now, right? You don't turn inward and, and try and calm down. It calms itself down. Why? And why? Because you stop running, right? And that's so perfect, this analogy. And it's the same with anxiety. The moment you stop fighting is the moment your body gets a signal. Oh, I can calm down, right? right. But it's an attitude. than something that you say. Yeah. Right. Right, right. The words, the words we use here, even the acronym for DARE is to elicit an attitude, not follow these steps diligently, and you will create this new attitude, right? Mm -hmm. It's, it's really sending this message of acceptance. And I wanted to mention to Amanda too, like, question, how do you shift your focus from trying to heal on battling this daily? It's kind of a hard question to answer because you're trying to heal implies that there's something wrong with you. And the problem here, the problem with almost basically everybody on here is that you're in a perpetual problem fighting, problem solving mode without an actual problem. It's problem solving mode that's the problem. You're trying to heal something that you're trying to fix something that's not broken. Yeah. So yeah. I don't um, know if that helps or pisses people off, but yeah. the problem is there's nothing that you're not broken. You're trying to, I must be broken because I feel X, Y, and Z, but feelings doesn't equal broken. You're, we're trying to let help you let go of problem solving mode. Yes. And you know, what's funny guys, and I'm, I'm sure you can attest to this, Michelle, a lot of our work in one-to-one -one coachings is trying to, to normalize things for people and convince them that everything is just fine, although they feel so awful, right? Because even though they're like, oh, I get it. I just need to accept it. All right, I'm going to do that. Like next call, they're like, yeah, so I did all that. But I, I, I can't help but wonder if this thing that happened to me back then is contributing to this. So it's a lot of undoing, right? Taking away uh, stories and beliefs that people have piled on to their anxiety identity, so to speak, right? This thing, anxiety about anxiety, panic attacks, you guys, is very simple. It's very, very simple. It's not easy to go through, but it's simple. So be aware to not overcomplicate it. If you find yourself not making any progress, it is most likely that you are not accepting at some level, period. Go back, read the book, reread it and reread it. And then ask yourself, honestly, mm, am I truly, truly accepting this? Or am I resisting in some subtle ways? Right? Am I still, just an example, why am I going on their Facebook pages? What's my intention? Why am I listening to the dear audio book on my way to work every day? although I know it by heart at this point. Right? Why do I have to, to, to sit in the passenger seat when I go with my friends? Right? Small things, small things. The, yeah. What am I doing and why am I doing it? Those, why? Ask her that, not well, how am I feeling? Like we're very aware of our thoughts and yeah. feelings and sensations. We are not very aware of our actions and behaviors. So at least shine that light on to not how am I feeling? Why am I feeling this way? Oh my gosh, it's back. It's, it's, what am I doing and why am I doing it? Why am I sitting in this seat and not this seat? Oh, because I feel better in this seat and I don't feel, I feel more claustrophobic in this seat. Oh, I feel better in this seat. Oh, I'm, I'm doing this because this feel, usually it comes down to something like that. And so the number one question that usually comes in on our one-to-ones is I get there, I get the, uh, I get the, the mindset, the concept behind it. I'm trying to accept and allow, 
but it's not, I don't think it's working or I'm not doing it right because I still feel blank or the thing isn't gone yet. Guys, is if you have a similar line that's running through your head, regardless of what context it's in, but I, I'm feeling disconnected. I'm trying to accept and love, but I'm still just so disconnected. I don't know when this will ever going to go, is ever going to go away. What am I doing wrong? Do you, anybody on here in the comments, there's over a hundred people on here right now. Um, Who's still focused on the physical sensation? Who still wants to tell me about their physical discomfort? Who still wants to tell me how shitty their thoughts are? Who still mm -hmm. wants to tell me the feelings they don't like or they're checking in? Why are you checking in? Be to see if I find blank. Then that's the process we're trying to change. Not what you, Not to see if what you found is gone. We're just trying to teach you how to, again, Leave shit alone. Find whatever it is you found and let it be. Let it be still. Brain fog, physical. I see it all coming up in the chat. Yep. Oh, but I'm still feeling brain fog. Yep. You have a problem with your relationship with brain fog. And your alarm now thinks brain fog is danger. Yeah. And what is your goal, guys? When it, no matter what it is, depersonalization, no matter what it is, are you applying there because your aim is to be less impressed by anxiety and its sensations? Or are you applying there to alleviate the discomfort mm -hmm. that these sensations bring? And that is a completely different story. Completely different. The one feels logic, logical. Oh yeah. So I'm applying there. So my sensations will get less and I can feel better. This is what we do. When I went to the doctor, I'm like, look, this is going on. He gave me some medication and I'm expecting after taking this medication that I do feel better. Mm -hmm. Right? It's not the same logic here with anxiety, right? Dare is aimed at changing your attitude and how impressed you are by anxiety and by the story and meaning you attach to your experience. Right? And I could say this over and over again. My husband, for example, I am sure he has experienced anxiety many times. He just doesn't, doesn't have a label for it. He would not say, I have anxiety. It's like, ah, I need to sleep. I'm on edge. <laughs> Leave me alone. <laughs> He's going to go into his man cave, do his thing. Three days later, come out and be okay. Right? Three days. But it's, <laughs> <laughs> but it's the same. It's the same sensations. Right? I've been sick since two weeks. Like yesterday night was, I had all the palpitations, the brain, weird dreams. I kind of felt detached, you see, but I don't have a story attached to it. I'm not saying, oh my God, why is this happening? What is this? How long is it going to last? What if this turns into a setback? What yeah. if, what if, what if? You see, that's a disordered part of anxiety, not the sensation. So you always want to aim all the tools, you know, the dare mindset to help you to help you change that disordered part of your thinking and the way you perceive these things. And then your body takes care of itself. Yeah. That's the part you we needs to say on every call that presence of anxiety is not the disorder. You don't get rid of anxiety to get rid of an anxiety disorder. It's the disordered response to anxiety. That's the problem. And I don't like the term, but you know, I always say that too. It's how I treat anxiety when it shows up, how I treat brain fog when it shows up, how I treat thoughts I don't like when they show up. This part is for is dare. This part is the part that labels the thing I don't like as danger. And so we're not dealing, I'm not talking about uh, this, can, how to deal with loneliness that comes with young adulthood. That's one of the questions that's, I'm already answering that. I'm just using that as context. Here's the feeling of lonely. How do I deal? There's nothing to deal. How to get better at being alone your perception of being alone, it means there's nobody around. Um, lonely and being alone are two different things. So it, again, the dare response is how I respond to my perception of being alone, how I respond to the facts that I feel disconnected right now. Yes. So maybe we should reframe it, Michelle. We should say dare responds for, for your thoughts about anxiety. <laughs> Your response for your attitude about anxiety. Yeah. How am I responding to the thing I don't like? Yeah. Like, it's not called the dare elimination method. It's called the dare response method. Yeah. How I'm responding to the presence of anxiety. 
Okay, time we do another right, question. Let's keep well. going. Okay, okay. Um, this is, am I on the right? Yes. Yeah, one of my last one hurdles. Of my last hurdles of recovery. So I would love if you can offer some guidance either in the webinar or just by re replying. You know, when your head starts swimming after a while when crammed for a test or when leaning a bunch of new, learning a bunch of new stuff, well, I often get this when entering a store and it leads to anxiety. Could I use the DARE approach or similar mindset for this? I think this is part of a sensory overload issue in which I get an excess of input side sound. Can I, can I want to also say another question that ties in perfectly so we can answer two questions at the same time from um, Teddy. Um, so sometimes I experience this weird rush where everything around me feels foreign and it's almost like how I am here kind of moment. It lasts a few seconds, only intense but then after the thoughts linger, I am worried that this is not anxiety or DPDR and something else. 99% of the time, it is me worrying about the feeling that only happens 1% of the time. So kind of like that scrambled brain feeling, right? That's why I wanted to ask that question at the same time, because mm -hmm. it's the same thing. I enter a, a store and it's kind of like, yeah, like this overloaded, everything's on high speed feel in my head. Oh, you're asking me? Mm. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I would ask, is this something you, you experience while in, in moments or when you're sensitized or is it something you generally feel? Right? But again, this goes back to what we just said earlier. So the sensation, the trigger is, oh, I feel this, this overload and that triggers anxiety. Can you do something about that? Absolutely not. Why does it trigger anxiety? Well, apparently you have hooked some kind of uh, a story, worst case scenario to that feeling, meaning, oh, whenever I feel this whoosh of sensory overload, that now means that. For example, oh, I could have a panic attack or that stores are dangerous or that I may be a very sensitive person or that something is wrong with my eyesight, blah, blah, blah. It could be so many things that you could attach to that. But it seems like you have attached some certain situation to this trigger. And then, of course, your amygdala fires. Now, the, um, the only question you, can, you need to ask yourself is, is it true? Does, is this situation the dangerous no, it's not. Okay. So I know this rationally, although my emotional brain is convinced of something else. So the only way for me to convince my emotional brain that this is not dangerous is by me going into that situation, allowing it to be there, letting the trigger happen, and then just going on with my shopping. I show my emotional brain with my behavior that we are okay. This is fine. And I do this repeatedly until the link of trigger and worst case scenario that is attached to it that triggers your amygdala to fire uh, until this dissolves. And then you don't have the two things happening at the same time. And this is how it works with all other triggers that you have attached any worst case sensation to yeah. situation. And like, so just even the worst case situations are written in here. Here's, I mean, for the, I know we were doing two questions at once, but there was one from Teddy. I experienced this weird, right? And I see you in the chat too. Hi, we got like a live action. I experienced this rush where everything around me feels foreign. And it's almost like, how am I here kind of moment? Yeah, that's how it feels. That's how it feels when I have a panic attack. You feel, and the only way I can describe it, it's like, I've tried to describe it before, like, I feel kind of like this rush, this rush comes over my head, like a bucket of energy and I fall forward almost. And then I feel like this part of my head sort of gets sucked back into some alternate universe. Right. And everybody around you is like really close to you and really far away at the same time. And you feel like you can hear your own voice and you feel just sort of like I'm in some alternate plane in this universe right now. Do I sound crazy? Do you guys know what I'm talking about? Do, does this sound similar to how it feels when you have that? Whoosh, I just kind of stepped back. My head got sucked back. Yeah. So Teddy. DP2, right? DP2. Everybody who experiences depersonalization, the feeling of being sucked back into the back of your head. It yes. almost like looking through your eyes. Like right. And now you're in the back of the room looking at yourself yeah. in the front of the room going, what the fuck is going yeah. on? Oops, sorry. I was going to be nice <laughs> on this call and I dropped it. <laughs> Sorry, I got so far you too. You can't help it, Michelle. <laughs> <laughs> but so, guys, again, not what keeps that, that might what have shook me, what kept you, what keeps keeping you stuck, Teddy, is 
again, it lasts only a few seconds, only tense. But then after that, I'm worried, this is, this must be something else. And I saw Luke, you posted that in the chat. Somebody else posted it. What's wrong with me? Yeah. There must be something wrong with me. Oh, this thing. Ah, not that. What else could be wrong with me? Yeah. What is wrong with me? And if you're constantly searching to see what's wrong with you because of present fluctuating scenarios, that's your problem. Treating yourself as if there's something dangerous, something unknown, like full of doubt. We stare at doubt. So there's a difference between what is and what could right? Oh, this could have affected this. This could be, this could be here forever. What could and what is are two different things. I've been posting a lot about this lately. If you guys have seen our recent posts, but like the what ifs they get nodded at. Yeah, maybe Mm -hmm. could, but what is, and what, what is, is facts in here. What could is your imagination of the future. Your imagination is not dangerous. That's not a problem. What, Problems are here, not your imagination of there. And by the way, just to add to this, what is wrong with me is anxiety's favorite question. I think we have a YouTube video. We have daily dares <laughs> just uh, on this question, right? Everybody knows that. What is wrong with me? Oh my God, something must be wrong. I'm broken. Uh, this will never go away. If you leave, I always say, if you leave what is wrong with me unanswered, you have the perfect recipe for your brain to go taka, 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 all the time until it comes up with a response. What is wrong with me is a question that your brain asks. And if you do not respond, your anxious mind will bring up all kinds of things that could be wrong with you. Oh, what if it's this? What if it's this? What if it's this? What if it's this? And you're like, oh God, yeah. Oh God, yeah. Oh, I haven't thought about that. Oh, true. Right? So it makes connections where there are no connections. It draws conclusions where there, there are no conclusions at all. It's wrong information that your anxious brain brings up. So I always say, you must be the person who responds to what is wrong with you. You must be the person. So when you walk into a shop and you get that weird sensation of DP, panic attack, whatever it is that you're feeling at the moment, and then there's a question, what is wrong with me? You must immediately respond with, remember the millisecond Michelle talked about? Mm -hmm. Nothing, it's just a panic attack. All right. Right. Damn, you give your- Right, because you saying what's wrong with me is what's wrong with you. That's, that's the, the part. That's the part we're going to change. Like, it's like anything else. Like if you walked into a store and had deja vu because deja vu is talked about, it's accepted. Everybody talks about having deja vu. We love announcing it. Oh my God, I'm having deja vu. Oh my gosh, I've been here before. Oh my gosh, deja vu. Oh my gosh, it's still going. It's still going. Like we talk about it. Like this is the stuff that's still quiet and secretive. And so you don't have deja vu and go, oh my gosh, what's wrong with me? Why? Why? Like, oh my God, I'm having deja vu. And it's left yeah, alone. So it's a weird it's feeling, true. but we leave it alone. But yeah. if you didn't know what deja vu was, it would be the same thing. This is so scary. Are you experiencing this? You're not, but I am. Oh my gosh, what's wrong with me? There must be someone. <laughs> Better hang on till it's gone. If you want to freak somebody out, you just always respond with, what? No, I haven't heard of that. <laughs> Never ever. heard of that before. Oh <laughs> Don't be worried. <laughs> and, and even just for like the original, the first question from Chris, um, you know, when you enter a store and it leads to anxiety, that's that everything feels. So the problem is you're in high alert, heightened focus, pupils are dilated, but there's nothing to focus on to right? If there was a, a, a monster that ran through the store, suddenly whoosh, it's like there's a place to plug it, plug in, like there's a socket to plug all that energy into. When there's no socket and you're in like tunnel vision, but with nothing to look at, you're left seeing in tunnel vision. That's why everything looks weird and distorted. You're, you're able to answer like your brain processes speed up but there's no need for it. So it feels like time slows down and speeds up at the same time. And it feels freaking weird. That's how it's supposed to feel. So the next step is, again, this is my little flow chart that I always post. What's happening right now? Because my body's up in survival mode. Is there something to survive through right now? And if there's no bees or murderers in the store, and I'm just left staring internally, looking at my own survival response, when I'm aware of it, I'm going to spend as little time here as possible. Ah, ah, 
my body, what this is what fight or flight mode looks like when there's nothing else to look at. When there's when you take the bear out of the equation and you're left with fight or flight response and there's nothing else to look at but fight or flight response, we start battling that. And that's what we're going to teach you how to leave alone, how to be nice to it. Oh, thanks. Oh, hey, girl. Thanks for showing up. Not danger. Hang out all you want. Not danger. Yeah, while accepting that this fight or flight that we fight, it, it misfires. Mm -hmm. right? What is wrong? Why is this happening? It's a misfire. Yep. It's nothing else. Think about it this way. This, our nervous system and our emotional stress system and all, all, all these things, they are very, very, very sensitive. And a system that is so sensitive is also very sensitive to misfires. And thousands of years ago, we did not have to worry about do others like our profile pictures? <laughs> How am I going to go through this job interview? How am I going to, I don't know, which school am I going to pick for my kids? I, we have so many more triggers in today's world, meaning that stress system that was uh, supposed to fire when there's just real danger now fires constantly. So you must be okay with the fact that sometimes it, it, it uh, misfires. And the problem becomes when we react to a misfire with anxiety, as Michelle said, when we start to fight the, the fight or flight, and this is when we create the disorder of anxiety, right? So what your body is doing is not pathological. Having a panic attack in the store is not pathological. Feeling spaced out from time to time is not pathological. It's not the problem. So let go of, of these ridiculous demands that we all have. We must be perfectly healthy all the time, physical wellness, mental wellness, of course, mental health is everywhere. Like it's this buzzword, right? But it's, I find it interesting because the more people talk about mental health, the more I feel it gets denormalized because it's almost like, right. You know what I mean? So now, now there's the de demand. Cause we're so specific on all the things that's wrong with us when it was yeah. nothing wrong before. Yeah. And you scroll through Instagram and Every third post is about heal your trauma. Do this with your neighbors or heal, 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 heal. Are you stuck with, struggle with? Let me help you this. Everything is so much about fixing stuff, right? And I think we need to understand that at a basic level, we all have issues and we will always have these issues. Sometimes they get more intense when we go through phases of maybe high stress or life challenges that's life right life is not supposed to be easy it never was <laughs> right? Right. so let's accept that we are at some level we're fucked we're always going to be so let's try to keep this at bay <laughs> but trying to be good to ourselves and taking care of ourselves and not add more anxiety to 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 something that is not necessary i'm trying to find a question here if you guys see me looking up the screen, I just have all my questions on a different laptop. There was something, somebody had a question about, oh, here, advice using the dare response when struggling with anxiety and chronic fatigue caused by trauma. So I want that you mentioned trauma. I just wanted to add that we can talk about trauma for hours and hours and days yeah. and have a whole webinars on that. So I'm not addressing trauma per se right now, but I talked to somebody a couple of weeks ago and it was like, they heard it like this for the first time. And I just want to make sure everybody else hears it maybe like this too. If you have been through some sort of trauma, whether it was acute trauma, like it, a one-off thing or chronic trauma, something that went on for a long period of time, especially long-term childhood trauma, then you are a survivor. So there's a good chance your alarm rang a lot for a long period of time when you were a kid and it served you well. Your ability to stay on high alert and check for nuances in your family, how people were acting, tones of voices, sounds, you survived because you were able to be on this high alert. Okay. And so now let's say your danger has passed. Your alarm has just done a very good job at keeping you alive. Uh, the person I was talking to thought, now I have this anxiety disorder because of my trauma. No, you're in a heightened state because you're a freaking survivor. You survived real life danger. And now your body is just doing a really good job at continuing to keep you alive. And this is where you get to give yourself the sense of peace where, wow, my alarm is ringing, 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 ringing. It's done such a good job of, sh of keeping me on high alert all the time. It's my job. 
I have to show my alarms present safety here. Wow. Thanks so much for keeping me alive. I'm safe here and I'm going to show you now. So if it's still ringing a lot and you've used that alarm to survive through a lot of your life, if anybody on here has, right? Fabulous. Fucking fabulous. You did a, it did a great job sending you energy to survive. And now you send this message of, of peace. It doesn't mean don't soar through trauma and attend to trauma for the sake of trauma. But a lot of people are going back to their past to try and stop having panic attack in the grocery store. And let's just find things that went wrong so I can stop having panic attacks. And they're, 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 you treat them differently for the sake of both of them. But just know that if you're left in a heightened state because of an extended period of trauma, it's because you were really good at surviving. And we're just teaching you how to let go of present survival behavior to send this message of safety right now. Yeah. So I hope you guys yeah. found that helpful. It's, I think that was, <clears throat> sorry, brilliant, Michelle. And I just would like to add <clears throat> something to that. Our amygdala is like a thermostate. <laughs> and in early childhood, if we experience a lot of trauma, it's, it's, it's like the thermostate is being set on very, very, very sensitive, right? And this keeps, <clears throat> keeps, keep staying like through our adulthood, but now it's not serving us anymore, like Michelle said, but we are still left with the consequences of that very sensitive setting. Now, some people fear that, oh, because I had these traumas in, in my past, now I will forever have this oversensitive emotional stress response, which you will not have because due to neuroplasticity. And if you do put in the work like there that teaches you how to ignore a misfire, how to look at it for what it is, how to distance yourself from that and move on with your life, your brain changes and you can change the settings, the default settings to a less sensitive state. So that is really the good news. It does take time and practice, but it is absolutely possible. So don't let anybody ever tell you just because just because you have experienced trauma that you will now forever have a more sensitive nervous system. It is not true. Okay. Cool. All right. Mm. Moving along here. Another one on intrusive thoughts. Why does anxiety trigger intrusive thoughts? And how do you not fall into the vicious cycle of anxiety? There's times when I can feel myself falling into that pit, even though I've been engaging in life and doing so well for months. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for everything you guys. You do are beyond amazing. I didn't say that. They said that, but I want to make sure I added that in there. So congratulations on, on falling in the pit. It's not going to be the last time. It's going to happen over and over and over again. Completely normal, right? So because you're learning a new new mindset, a new way how to approach this. And if if I remember correctly, why does anxiety trigger intrusive thoughts? Was that the question? Why does anxiety trigger intrusive thoughts and how do you not fall into the vicious cycle of anxiety? So what is an intrusive thought? So it's an unwanted thought with some distressing content that pops up into your consciousness. And if that happens to be in a phase of your life where you're very sensitive and it catches your attention, you're like, oh, and then you do this, right? Oh my God, what does this now mean? Now you're oh my God, why? Oh my God, why? Yeah. Now you have the intrusive thought, right? The intrusive, an intrusive thought without that reaction, it doesn't turn into a sticky thought, right? Mm -hmm. A thought is just a thought. And, you know, we have thoughts of all, all sorts. A lot of them are distressing and uncomfortable. We just don't notice them. And if we notice them, usually we're just able to, to brush them off. Like, oh, that was weird. Done. When we're highly sensitized, we're like, Oh my God, it's almost like we're putting a hook to that thought. And now we have it here. Now we stare at it. Where do you come from? Why did you happen? And what does that now mean? Oh my God, what is wrong with me? You see, you guys, how this theme is interwoven in all of these questions. I have a trigger. Let's do a triangle. I have a trigger, a thought. I assign a meaning to it. Oh, this now means. So I need to prevent that. And then the third part is, Oh, how can I prevent myself from going crazy, murdering somebody, whatever the content of the intrusive thought is? And now I fight this. Right? So it's always trigger, worst case scenario, and my fight or my control behavior. And control, sometimes control behaviors are obvious, like I avoid something. 
And sometimes they are not so obvious, but are more internal, like, oh, let me constantly monitor my thoughts or my heartbeat to see if there are any changes that might mean that the worst case scenario that I have attached to this could come true. And this is how I live in this triangle. I have a thought, oh, the, oh my God, and then my fight. So an intrusive thought is nothing without your fear. Right. Intrusive your thought's not your problem. Ah, we all have intrusive thoughts and choose. I am like uh, the human form of an intrusive thought. She okay? is. She <laughs> is. The <birds> are unbeatable. <laughs> intrusive thought is like they show up, they're rude. They want your attention. They got feathers and glitter. So you can have a room full of people and somebody busts in. They're like, pay attention to me. La, 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 la. And, and then if you go, Okay. And you just start paying attention to them and like, well, they keep talking. She doesn't shut the freaking hell up. So I got to keep sitting there listening to her. Now, if I started talking over Aida and I start throwing glitter and dancing and acting like a fool and she's telling something, she's talking about something more important as distracting as I am. It's I, the thought, like my goal is to not get rid of to shut Michelle up, although that might be some of your goals. Good luck. Um, my, my goal is not to get rid of Michelle. My goal is to get better at getting involved in what Aida is saying, because this intrusive thought right now is unimportant. Now, if I showed up and was like, oh my gosh, Aida, you're on fire. Like I heard it, it caught my attention and the content's important. So I need to do something. Up I shouldn't even say the content is important because that just threw off. What I came in to say, my, my presence here is important. Thoughts showed up and something action needed to be taken right now. But if I just show up and I'm like, pay attention to me, pay attention to me, pay attention to me, pay attention to me. You don't have to like it. You guys have plenty of thoughts that pop into your head that are pleasant, right? Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh. I just had this memory of spring break when I was a kid. I just smelled somebody's sunblock. Or I just smelled Dracar. Do you guys have Dracar that, that yeah. cologne from like the nineties? Who on the chat knows Dracar, right? You ever smell that old cologne from back then? And you're like, throw back to, well, and cool water. Yes, thank you. That's my person right there. And like, you just get thrown back into a memory. You had a, a random spontaneous thought when anxiety does. Anxiety is like the bright light that cranks up, that clearly shows you mm. what's present, but it's what comes next, Here's the intrusive thought. Ta-da! Pay attention to me. And then you continue to provide it with your undivided attention. This is your problem, not the shitty thought. And the meaning you assign to it, right? What does yeah. this now mean? Because if you're like Michelle and you have a lot of intrusive thoughts throughout the day, but your inference is, mm, I don't care. Oh, funny. Oh, all right. Right, the, the, oh, look the, at that one. The control behavior it, it doesn't have any anything to, to, to sustain. So this is the most important thing. If you say, oh my God, I didn't enjoy the thoughts. This is horrible. You can be sure as hell that you're going to engage in some sort of control behavior, right? But if you change your response from, oh, okay. Oh, well, another shitty interest of thought. Who, the fuck, who cares? Um, it's done. That's all you need to do, right? Yep. But the, oh my God. I had another one and this one was really bad, right? This one was about, I like the funniest intrusive thought I must share with you guys. We once had a dear advance call, somebody shared. I found it so funny. It's not funny, obviously. <laughs> it was a young guy who was not married and had no kids. <clears throat> and he kept having intrusive thoughts about randomly kicking children in the street. Oh, I have those thoughts all the time. <laughs> all the thought, time. <laughs> And this was so funny. It was not even something that had to do with his life because usually people who have kids or work with kids do get intrusive thoughts about you know, harming kids in, in, in some way. But you see, he, he went from being completely shocked to laughing about these thoughts. And that was awesome because in the end, we all laughed about them. And this is when they, when they no longer were a problem for him, right? right. You see again how perspective, attitude, right. and focus the way to go. And it's still, it's imagination land because you could see some kid and imagine kicking them. Sure. I mean, imagine it. So that's just, it's just signs. Honestly, what that's a sign of really is a good imagination. Yes. That's it. Mm -hmm. If you have a good imagination, you can come up with a lot of weird shit.
right? But if you don't trust that your imagination, what's wrong with me? Why would I have such terrible thoughts? What could be wrong with me? I better do something now to prevent myself from kicking kids in the future. Oh my gosh, better always have somebody by me so I don't kick kids. What if I do it one day, right? What if I lose control and I kick kids? And that's where problems the problem that lies and, and to kind of directly respond to somebody's question who just, where to go? Uh, I don't see it. Oh my gosh. There's been so many comments. Um, but yeah, basically like, no, it's not the thought. It's the, your perception of that thought, your gasping and clutching of pearls response, right? <gasps> but I don't want to kick kids, right? Yeah. Don't kick Why kids. Don't that? kick them then. <laughs> <laughs> what's, what's wrong with me for having that thought i don't want to kick kids in the future yeah and i better keep it care oh my gosh now i have another thought now i have push kids push oh, i had a thought about kicking kids now i can't stop thinking about kicking kids of course because you're trying to not you can you can go find thoughts to have you can't decide to not have thoughts if you're trying to not have thoughts you're going to go find more of the thoughts you're trying to not have yeah, care less. You must care less about them. Right? Change your inference. What do they mean? Nothing. They mean nothing. And because they're so intense, we think that they must mean something. Like no normal person would think about something sexual with family members or pushing, kicking kids, whatever, poisoning somebody. Right? Nobody normal would think. Yes, we do. And I wish <clears throat> so. I wish this is something we would talk about much more often in school, in university. (laughs) We should talk about kicking kids more often. No, not that far. (laughs) Not that far, Michelle. (laughs) But that it's normal to have really, really weird and bizarre thoughts and that they do not mean anything. I think we have a society have always equated, you know, because we have put so much value on self-esteem and positive thinking Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you guys how many books about positive thinking the law of attraction (laughs) and the power of the mind have you read and we're convinced that oh if i just constantly think positive thoughts then my life will make a good turn and if i if i do happen to have negative thoughts oh that's that's a harbinger for something really bad right this is what we have been sold for decades Nobody told us, oh, you know what? Nobody cares about your thoughts. It's your actions. Yeah. Right? Actions. And, and you're thinking about your thought. Like there's thoughts and there's how I think about my thoughts, right? Yes. Most people are having thinking yeah. problems. Like Robert just wrote, oh, I'd rather think about kicking kids than going crazy. Well, Robert, guess which pro- guess which question you probably submitted? What if I go crazy? Not what if I kick kids? Because you're like, oh, whatever. Yeah, I'm going to kick a kid. But I could really go crazy. Right. And we're just good. This was another question. I'm just going to paraphrase it from Chris, which is basically that struggling. I'm currently struggling. Who hears that word? Struggling with letting go. It's like jumbo shrimp, right? I'm struggling with letting go, trying really hard to let go of the fear that my anxiety panic will one day progress into something more severe, like schizophrenia or psychosis, where I spin out and lose. Basically, you know, I go crazy. What if I get so scared? I go crazy. Okay. Mm -hmm. And this is what if I throw up? What if I die? What if I get embarrassed? It guys, it's all going to be the same. I have a thought feeling sensation of something unpleasant that I find that I don't like right now. And I'm hooking it to some worst case scenario, gasp and clutch pearls. (gasps) I don't want that to happen. Better do something here to prevent there. And Mm -hmm. we're in a lot of here now fight for either fighting things that already are past or fighting things here to prevent bad things from happening. Can you guys all see, we still have about a hundred people on the chat. Can you guys all see, even if it's not your particular question, even if we didn't get to yours, are you spending a lot of time in either involved in something and your involvement does nothing but find you more of it, or you're desperately involved in something here, trying to make sure there doesn't happen. Or convince yourself that everything's going to be fine and okay. And also, this this is to everybody who who fears going crazy, developing psychotic illness. Why do so many people with anxiety fear that? It's actually very interesting, and it's 
due to two things. First of all, there's misconception about psychosis. Very, very big misconception. Mm-hmm, big time. And the second part, and this is maybe something that people do not consider, is anxiety not only creates this isolation from the world, but it also at the same time creates an overperception of everything. So I feel weird. I notice that I feel weird and like cut off from everything. And this is now magnified like a thousand times. <laughs> And I perceive everything very, very intensely, not just my external world, but also my internal world. So my emotions, my thoughts, the fluctuations of my body, people's voices, all the sensory information that comes in, all of that is magnified. And this overperception is something that we, we tend to see in horror movies or in movies where people go crazy. Everything is just out of control because everything happens at frantic speed it comes with this feeling of being out of control and we do equate out of control with going crazy and going crazy on the other hand we have uh, we equate to hearing voices you know hallucinations of all sorts grandiose ideas la la, la delusions and now we feel because we already feel out of control that this is going to be the next thing that is going to happen. Right? That's the first thing. But be, keep in mind that these things are positive symptoms that not always happens in psychosis. Right? So the opposite happens. People withdraw. They have flowery speech. They have impaired cognitive performance. This is not what you experience in, in, when, when you're highly sensitized. You experience the overperception. Everything is too much. Everything is going too fast, right? So this feels like you're losing control and losing control is linked to, oh, what if I go crazy and I don't want to go crazy because blah, 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 this happens, right? Next time you're in that very heightened state and you have the fear of going crazy, just remind yourself, oh, this is just overperception. Right? I can just ease into it and let it happen and just write it out because nothing is going to, if I have not gone crazy until today, it's, it's not going to happen. Yeah. Right? And I don't know one person, I'm Michelle, just look at the literature. Ask Michelle, ask me, we have never seen a person and anxiety is all we do all day, every day for years day. that have <laughs> gone going crazy right um so yeah you know, and it comes it comes also like if you go through the dsm i don't suggest doing so but like one of the one of the the check boxes is mm-hmm. you may experience especially with panic dpdr yes okay but it it's when you're in an anxious state you're in a heightened awareness of being so disconnected so it's not i'm disconnected i'm so aware of how disconnected i am yeah right? Then now it's, oh my gosh, this means crazy. And then we take our own biased opinions of what we think crazy is our own stereotypical opinion of crazy. Oh my gosh, I heard something. I heard something in the shower the other morning. I was telling somebody on a one-to-one call, I swore I heard something right behind my ear and I turned and there was nothing. And then I heard my daughter in the bathroom. So the bathroom walls connect. I'm like, oh, it must have been my daughter. I'm like, but it really felt like it was in my ear. And then what? What did I do right after that? I kept showering. What else was there to do? Uh, Somebody else would have booked a call with me and said, and then I I heard the sound. It was really quick. But then... Oh my gosh, that means crazy. Am yeah, I crazy? Okay. And now I'm I'm checking and I'm looking to see if I see things. I'm looking to see if I hear things. And then I did I hear something? And then I'm asking my husband, did you hear that? Okay, good. Do you hear that? And then we're we're now looking to see again what's wrong with me. There must be something wrong with me because I felt something unpleasant and I got scared. Misinterpretation. And guess what? What's nice is we get shit wrong all the time. Of course, we tend to be a bunch of people who never get things wrong. It comes with the territory. We're a little bit of a know-it-all, right? <laughs> but like, we do get things wrong. Like, oh, I thought, oh, I thought that was my husband for a second, but it, that's just some other guy. Oh, oh, I thought there was a bug on my arm, but it was just a hair. And so our body misinterprets shit all the time. All Let the it. Time. All the Let time. It. Can you can you remember a moment when you when you found a bug or a spider? 
on your arm. You're like, oh my God. And then you kept noticing it everywhere on the body. <laughs> it's yep. weird. It feels real, right? right? As Michelle said, body interprets things, but it's the, the work of our rational mind, of us, to keep all this craziness at bay and to say, no, 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 no. Look, this is that. It's almost like parents and children a little bit. Mommy, mommy, oh my God, oh my God. And you're like, no, it's okay. It's fine. No, this is what is going on. And this is actually our job for the rest of our lives with our emotional brain, right? Yeah. Sometimes it's a little bit more work because, you know, they get sensitized and, and they're very loud. And then it again uh, becomes easier. Right? Yes. And like Robert was saying, like training a dog right? Like if your brain has, your alarm has misinterpreted something, how do you show it? It got it wrong. Not by going, go away, just go away, just go away because he's screaming and I don't want him to scream right now. So stop thoughts. And stop. Are you done? Are you quiet? Are you... That's not how you show that. Oh, you got it wrong. It's Oh, you thought those thoughts were danger. So now I have fear and thoughts. I have fear now for thoughts. My body sent me fear so I could do something about those thoughts. Whoops. Yes. Thoughts aren't danger. Thoughts about danger aren't danger right now. I have, I show my alarm what's safer or not by how I treat what it's showing me and how I treat the presence of my alarm. Okay. Anxiety shows up because it thinks I need energy to fight these things. Okay. So we tend to fight thoughts, feelings, and sensations. And we also fight the feeling of anxiety. You cannot fight away your fight or fight flight response. Your alarm shows up so you can hang on. You don't hang on till your alarm stops. You let go. Your alarm winds itself down. And I see this message here. What is dare? I know this, this is kind of an open call, really an open call for people who have some information about dare and maybe already have the free app or have read the book dare is basically this approach it's it's an acronym it's diffuse allow run towards engage if you go on to our app um, you'll find more information about dare there's a book on amazon there are a ton of youtube videos aida and i have our own instagram accounts that we send the messages of dare everywhere as much as possible. Um, so yep, come on. If, if you, if you like this approach, come on to our app, you can join the premium version of this app. It's something like $10 a month, nine something a month. And, um, and includes a little Facebook community where you can chat on. I try and share posts on there almost daily. We run webinars here. Um, we have twice a month. Programs. We have boot camps. Um, so there's a lot of resources uh, still to, to dig in. But make sure you do read the book. I think that's uh, always the first step after getting getting the app. Uh, the book is this, you know, you get all of this in detail. And uh, I think it's important to have read that first. So everything makes more sense. But we have um, hardcover. We have audiobook. And I think we have a lot of excerpts from the book on the app too. Is that true, Michelle? We have what? Do we have some of the chapters in the app available? No, we have um like a basic um overview of the dare response, like a yeah. shortened version. So if you go on the app, you can hear the dare response. It's like, I don't know, 10, 10 15 minutes long. And it's the overall essence of dare. But mm. again, it's, it's real. We're really teaching you a, a different, a, probably a different approach to what you've tried to do before. This is not about coping. This is not about calming down. We're not no, going to teach you. No managing, no. how to get through things. This is how to heal the disorder, which is the disordered relationship you've had with the presence of anxiety. Yes. And when you do so, this fades back to where it belongs. Fear of fear. Yes. Oh, that's right. Valentina, thank you. I have, um, I outlined the four steps of dare also on the YouTube channel. I did one for D, one for A, one for R, one for E. That might help um, explain it a little more too. I forgot about that. Cool. <clears throat> All right. I'm so sorry for my voice. <laughs> Thank you, everybody who joined today. We hope you found this helpful. And if you have not had enough of us yet, you can get <laughs> more of us on, on YouTube or on Dear Advance Bootcamp. All channels. Yeah, we, we have call. we have um, group calls. Um, somebody, a few people questioned about one to one calls. Aida and I both offer one-to-one -one calls. We are not going to tell you anything different. We are going to no. maybe help 
apply this to your particular situations or explain it a little better. Some people like a one-to-one -one call. That's why we offer them. Um, you can find that on the website, uh, dairyspons.com slash coaching. Thank you guys. Thank you, Michelle. Love Thank you, Aida. Thanks so much for joining Thank us. Till next Bye, guys. Time. Bye bye. Bye. Take care. Thank you for listening to the Dare Podcast. The Dare app has over 1 million downloads and is helping people all around the world to overcome anxiety and panic attacks. You can download the app for free at dareresponse.com.